I love the sound of wind chimes. So I sampled my wind chimes and made the Wind Chimes Ableton Live Pack. It's a collection of instruments that you can use to have wind chime sounds in your own music, and you can play them like playable instruments. Every sound you hear in this music was made with those samples, including the white noise, the bass, some of those strange pads and angelic sounds in the distance. You can get the Wind Chimes pack and use it in your own music at brianfunk.com. And if you're a member of the Music Production Club, the Wind Chimes pack comes with your membership, along with a lot of other great things to help you in your music making adventures. Check out the Music Production Club at brianfunk.com slash mpc. Hello and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have fellow Ableton certified trainer, Alberto Chaffa. Alberto has been, a, you've been a trainer for now uh, for quite a few years. Four, five, yeah, four or five years, right? Cool, man. Um, yeah, he's a great trainer, great guy, lots of fun to talk to. Um, we've been meaning to do this one for a long time. We've finally gotten the, the ducks in a row, as they say. Um, you can check out his work at musicalguest.net. He's doing lessons. He's helping people uh, build their live shows, um, teaches. He's a fellow teacher as well and has some, some like school, like actual, you know, kids at school teaching. So we might get into some of that too, I bet. But um, really excited to talk to you, man. Welcome to the show. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really, really excited to finally make it here. Yeah, and you know, for the people listening, um, we've already been talking for an hour, so <laughs> lots to say. It's nice to you know get some time to sit down with you. We've we hung out a little bit at Loop a couple of years ago. Um, Very but that's always chaotic. It's nice to have a minute to sit down with you here. Yeah, no, and the, one of the reasons I'm so appreciative, and I've told you this before the show, is your show and your work has been a personal inspiration to me, and it's I, I think I called it a north star earlier, where. <laughs> At a point where I was not sure what I was going to do with my life, where I, I could apply my skills, I saw this guy going by Afro DJ Mac back in the day uh, who had a bad teaching background and was also helping musicians and giving away packs and all these cool things. So that was definitely uh, the work that you do in your podcast and everything you put out was a great North Star for somebody like myself who didn't know what options there were out there for somebody with these skills. So. It's really a treat to be here today because well, of that. That's great to hear because it's a treat to have you too. And um, I appreciate you saying that and sharing that, um, you know, as we, we said this too, but uh, you don't always know like when you're teaching, like especially I think when, we, when you're in like the school situation where they didn't sign up to be there and they wouldn't come if they didn't have to. Um, you don't know like how you might or might not affect them so it is cool to hear and um it it goes to show too like it's just life really right like you don't know um how your little things you do affect other people yeah i do remember you sent me like a message an email or something and um just wrote back friendly conversation and stuff um it was it was cool to talk to that it was cool to hear like you were going for the certification and everything um but it's just uh it's nice, you know, and uh, just simple things like that, like turn into something that actually has impact and meaning. So, ev like everything matters, you know. Everything. Uh, and speaking to that, you know, the, the fact that you wrote back, you know, that, that was so cool because I'm a shameless reacher outer. Uh, I will reach out <laughs> to anybody and it's led to some really good things and, and great relationships and a few no's and that just kind of slides off my back and, and you move on to the next one. But the fact that you replied and, and gave of your time and, and gave advice that speaks a lot to the why behind what you do. Right. And that was just so cool. So yeah, I always encourage people out there, if, if you're trying to get in touch with somebody, reach out, but don't waste their time. Right. Cause that's, there's, those are two different things. We're like following, you know, reaching out with a purpose or an intention, uh, maybe even appreciation uh, versus just reaching out to like, you know, I talked to this person or I did this thing or that. And that's just kind of an uneven exchange, in my opinion, between the two parties. Hmm. 
Well, uh, it was my pleasure. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember exactly what you said, but it was definitely like an interesting, uh, you know, personalized message. And it's, it's hard not to, you know. It was probably a multi-page ramble, man. That, to be <laughs> honest with you, I was, I was really at a point where I was desperate to find my community. I was desperate to find my like vocation, to call it that. I had all these different experiences professionally and all these different ambitions creatively. Um, and I remember that feeling. It was people like you, Laura Escudé was another person that I just randomly wrote, um, you know, frantic email, like, this is my situation. You know, what's a good way to approach this? Uh, Serafin Sanchez, who's kind of been a mentor to me, he's a, a Ableton brand manager who works in Texas as part of his territory. And he's another person that I reached out to. And it's just so heartwarming that people read somebody's like manifesto of I want to be an Ableton certified trainer or what I think about what you're doing or just admiration and they go oh, okay I'll take some time to reach back out to this person and give them some advice or give them some direction and all those people like you Laura Seraphin are still um people that I look to as like trendsetters in this like or like north stars again to use that word where I'm seeing like getting inspiration but also direction from the work that you do you know, it's kind of funny, um, in almost the opposite way. Um, I've had my fair share of, uh, you know, comments that are, you know, insulting, degrading, and, you know, you know how the internet is, right? Um, you can get some, like, some of the dark sides of people come out. And I've, my policy with that stuff is either ignore it or just kind of kill them with kindness, you know, don't, I'm not going to get into it with you. And, you know, I'm not going to have an argument. But um, I've gotten a few, and uh, there was one email in particular that like never left my head because it was just like so insane. Like not insane, but just like so um, strong and emotional. Like about how much they disliked me and what I'm doing and everything. And I wrote back. <laughs> I was like, listen, you know, I'm really sorry to hear that you're so upset. I'm, I never wanted to upset anyone. You know, if there's something in particular, you think, uh, whatever. I was just really kind and trying to be understanding. And um, the person wrote back and like, very apologetic. Like, I didn't think you'd even read it. I didn't know, like, almost like didn't know that I was a person, you know. And um like uh, it, it then started to turn into this like friendly exchange. And I've found like pretty much every time when that happens, when I get that like negativity coming my way, um, either, you know, by not responding, it tends to just go away. But uh, with reaching out and just a um, positive way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, it almost always turns positive and the people, oh, I was upset that night, you know, my dog ran away and, um, you know, saw this, whatever it happened, you know, but it's, um, cause there's that part inside you that wants to be like, oh, who do you think you are talking to me like that? But it's not personal, you know, it was something else. And as soon as you like then come back as like a person and an actual human being, it's, it's interesting how that changes. Yeah, it's aggression reacting to aggression, right? But then when faced with humanity or with openness, it, it almost disarms that aggression. And at least it's been my experience. Yeah. I, I've had to look out for myself in, in pretty dangerous situations in, in my past. And I grew up in a part of the world that's known for, you know, not being as safe as other parts. And um, just having that openness and that that humanity is, is I've had it, I've had it disarm disarm really nasty situations because I think people when when we get aggressive they're inviting you to like push my button so that you can have a reason to do something mm. right when you just go hey I'm another human and I didn't intend to make you feel this way I, I remember I must have done something wrong uh, when I was driving to get some coffee like a year ago and this guy just started following me honking and just really aggressive so I pull into the coffee place and he gets out and he is fuming just uh, like ready to let me have it and i sort of let him bent a little bit and i just went like hey man i really just want to shake your hand and apologize 
I didn't want this, you know, I didn't want to make you feel this way. I didn't want this to, to get this, but you got to understand I'm just driving and you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's something that happened. I didn't do it to you. Mm. And it was really interesting as the conversation progressed to seeing his shoulders, maybe roll down a little bit, seeing his chest deflate, seeing mm. his just demeanor go like changed from an aggressor to a human. And then he was a little embarrassed. He was like, yes, I'm sorry. I did kind of overreact and I haven't run into him again. It's like my regular coffee shop, but it, that's sort of where I'd like to leave things is if I run into you again, do I want to be worried that I have this angry person out to get me? Right. Just neutralize this. Let's get on the same page and maybe we can be best friends. And that, mm. that, that's, that tends to be a better option. You might have started going to a different coffee shop after that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, you're right. I mean, it's hard to keep yelling at someone to keep attacking them when, when they're not like responding you know it tends to deflate and um i think um it's great that you are putting out that like just positive energy to people too and being like thankful to them i wanted to ask you um as a i forget how you put it you're a did you say like a chronic reacher outer or uh something <laughs> like that have you ever had anything like irreparably bad happen like um because I guess what I'm trying to get at is like there's people don't like to do this is like the cold call like kind of reaching out to someone is a little weird and scary and and it, and it could even just be like a person on the street you know like someone in your in your coffee shop you want to get to know better you know um, have you ever had any like real negative uh, consequences to that kind of way of living no and that I think that's the <clears throat> value of taking risks the worst thing that could happen is usually not that bad like usually the worst thing is somebody doesn't reply or they'll say no like just very genuinely or like directly say we're not doing this or this is not an option uh, but for the most part i think people I, I feel it myself too when when somebody reaches out and is interested in your work or is um, validating what you're doing and sharing how it's you know, inspired me or changed my life. I think it's a different dynamic than just reaching out and saying, Hey, I want something from you. Like mm -hmm. get me on your podcast or something like that. And mm. uh, that's what I meant about like having, not wasting somebody's time, really reaching out and making it an exchange, right? Like give them a little something like sometimes the creator or the creative person also needs that encouragement of saying, Hey, I'm this person in Nebraska and I saw your video and it, really blew my mind and now i'm applying it to my workflow and, and making this music and why don't you check it out and i feel like that's a different um way to reach out that doesn't leave a lot of opportunity for something bad to happen or, or for somebody to take it the wrong way um a, a, an example of somebody reaching out that i just i immediately when somebody reaches out to me out of the blue they almost have already won me over hmm. you know, um I'm thinking of a specific example, Matthew. Um, he's a really young man. I think he's um, in, in the New England area, I think Connecticut. But uh, I just got a random email from, email from a Matthew S. And he was just talking almost like how I felt like I wrote to you, just like this sense of urgency. I need to learn live. I need to produce this. I need to set up my controller to do this, this, and that. And I was like, wow, this is, this is a pretty legit client. And I, I love working with people that have a vision, people that take it seriously nothing against people that are just trying to do it for fun or as a hobby, but there's something that really feeds me seeing somebody dedicate themselves to like overcoming a creative challenge. And I thought, you know, I, I recognize that in Matthew and uh, I ended up getting a cell phone after we emailed back and forth like 10 times, <laughs> I dialed the number and it's an 11 year old boy. Hmm. And I was like, whoa, first of all, I need to get permission from your mom uh, if we want to be playing on the phone together. And I get the mom on the phone. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. He does this all the time. He ends up like reaching out to all these adults in different professions and he gets them to share their knowledge with him. So he's learned piano and saxophone and wow. all these computer skills just by, you know, following that impulse and reaching out to people in a really friendly way. And he's just a kid. So I'm, I, I love working with him. I always end up, you know, throwing some classes his way throughout the year and finding ways to like align our schedule. And it's interesting seeing somebody like that because at that age, you know, they could be 
um, you know, they could go into medicine for all I know and, and yeah. be completely into Ableton production right now. So it's interesting seeing him go from like, he was all into light shows when I first started working with him. I don't know if you run into a lot of like younger people that are really into light shows on, on controllers and programming that. And then seeing him go into, I want to create my own music and I want to enter a remix contest. And anyway, it's just a cool example of my admiration for people that reach out and, and start relationships, genuine relationships with people out of good, um, a genuine interest, not um, an interest of getting something out of it. Hmm. Hey, good for Matthew S. I mean, to have the the courage, even like as a as a child, as a young man, to uh, reach out to people that are grown up and established in their field. And uh, that, I, I mean, I was like afraid to call my friend's house when I was a kid because I might get their parent on the phone, you know. Mm. So I, I can I think that's a really great quality to have, and I think um, part of you know getting it anywhere any sort of success is the willingness to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation and have uncomfortable conversations and um, take take the risk of putting yourself out there. Yeah, but for him, and it's interesting because that if if you seek that discomfort, eventually that discomfort becomes. A type of comfort and yep. i think you're getting into that a little bit earlier yeah yeah like you're only find things uncomfortable because you're not used to them really mm -hmm. and, and after a while you know i can remember uh becoming a teacher and uh i i wasn't really like the like a loud person in the class that was always raising his hand or anything, you know, I, I spent a lot of my schooling years like kind of lying low <laughs> and um, to have to speak in front of the class was like terrifying. I remember vividly the first time I had to do it as a student teacher and the, the woman I was working with said, uh, you know, Mr. Funk, would you like to say something to the class? I'm like, me? <laughs> like, <laughs> No, <laughs> that was like my initial like in, internal reaction. Was like, not really, <laughs> you know, to talk to like these like high school students. But then after a while, next thing you know, it's just what you're doing every day, and and I think everything gets that way. Like we as humans, we have this like remarkable ability to adapt and just make a routine out of even like the craziest, most unusual situations. Yeah. I think in education, especially, um, sorry. No, 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 I was just going to say it's good practice, whatever it is. Yeah, go ahead. I think in education, especially modeling, going through something uncomfortable for the sake of growth is, is something that um, your students really benefit from seeing, right? That, that leading by example. Hmm. You know, um, this might not be a bad time to just uh, get into something that you've taken on recently to help get over some of that discomfort. And this is, uh, so we've been trying to do a podcast over the years, like, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. And then you recently sent me an email saying, I finally got a reason to talk to you. <laughs> Which I was like, you didn't really didn't need one, but. Um, and that goes to show why I needed to take on this thing. I'm, I'm such an overthinker. Um, and I don't know where that comes from, but I sometimes paint myself into a corner thinking of like, I have to find the perfect topic for Brian's podcast. And I think you'd told me before, we don't need a topic. We can just talk. But uh, I heard, what do you call the short episodes? Do you have a name for those? Cause I really, those are my favorite ones. No, oh, that's fun to hear. Um, <laughs> no, not really. Uh, they're just usually they're the ones I do by myself. I, I, a lot of them start in the high school classroom, actually. Like, uh, I like to do these like little things. Usually, like on Wednesday, I have Wednesday wisdom, and it's totally unrelated to anything. It's just something that uh, I've maybe come across, or I just think is like I. I wish I knew this when I was your age, or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, they're just uh, things usually that I'm wrestling with, or just discovering, or or they're reminders to myself. Um, and I, I don't know. I got you probably run into this too, but like. Uh, I, I'll say one thing and I'll read something, I'll learn it. And then I, you know, I have to relearn it all the time. I keep reminding myself, like, it's not like once you get it, you have it. You have to like keep exercising that muscle. So that's a lot of what that, those episodes are. It's just like, Hey, this is something I, I need to keep in mind myself. Yeah. They do have that feeling of 
like Brian's thoughts or like your, your message to yourself almost like you're, you're writing this memo for your own benefit, but then sharing it with us. And the episode in question uh, was the it's yes. And right. Is that what the, the title of the episode was like? Maybe so. <laughs> yes. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yes. And that's what we were kind of hinting at earlier. And, and that episode was what got me to call you and say, Hey, let's talk about this because in order to get out of my comfort zone, you know, as Ableton certified trainers, you know, we get put into situations where m most people would be really uncomfortable. Not only are we presenting in front of others, but sometimes you're presenting in front of somebody that might be your hero or somebody whose work you really admire or somebody that's just got this cocky attitude. You never know what you're walking into and you always are expected to, you know, have this certain demeanor of like coolness and I've got this and preparedness. And I was telling you my, my first ever presentation as a certified trainer, I, I really planned this big, like, I don't know, for me, it was like my debut. So I wanted to do something special. And I had met uh, the great Adam Neely, who's a, an awesome YouTuber who I encourage everybody to check out right now. Um, I met him at an Ableton event at Loop and I, we just got to talking and he was interested in doing stuff in Austin. And so I worked with another great person, Francis Prev, uh, and Pete over at ACC, which is a community college here in Austin. And they were gracious enough to create this event where they brought Adam down and I got to open for him and do a presentation. And if anybody's seen Adam present or his YouTube, it's just kind of like, I'm sure, of, of course he puts a lot of work and he's put a lot of work into them, but it just feels very natural. He's just kind of flowing. And then I saw my presentation. I was very stiff and it was very like scripted. And I remember back then, I would write pages and pages of outlines and then like narrow them down. And then I'm going to go from this to this to demonstrate this feature of live. And it just didn't feel fun. Like I couldn't access hmm. what I wanted to access in front of people, which is a combination of like a live show and a lecture, right? It can't just be all lecture because then it's just school and kind of boring. So I started thinking like, what can I do to remedy this? And one of the things that came up was improv theater and just improv comedy, just the, the practice of, you know, jumping out of a plane and building your parachute on the way down. And it was, it was very scary <laughs> to start this. I found a, a great school, the Institution Theater, close to my house here in Austin that is now closed, unfortunately, led by the amazing Tom Booker. He's a guy that's had, you know, a, a really, really awesome history in comedy. And, you know, he had all these stories about the comedians that I grew up idolizing as a kid. And just a little side note, I grew up on the border of Mexico and Texas on the Mexican side. Um, and I would get American TV signals because back then you saw like airwaves. And that's sort of how I learned English was through watching mm -hmm. American TV, American cartoons. And so comedy and TV and all that stuff's like has a big place in, in just my upbringing. So I kind of was curious about pursuing improv for that. But it's like, you know, you're already doing music and all these other things that are already an outlandish pursuit, right? So why would you want to take it seriously? So I started taking it more as a professional development and like going in and trying to find a way to be looser and be more off the cuff. And what I found is that, you know, my perception of what improv was, was totally off. I thought it was people trying to be goofy and trying to be funny and silly. And there's certainly room for that. But it, what it really is, is a discipline of it focuses on being in the moment at all times. And the only way to do it wrong is to not be in the moment. And um, your episode, Yes And, highlights one of the main tenets of improv, which is acceptance. And always, no matter what comes your way, accepting that that's the situation that you're in, you're on the same boat as your scene partner, but then you also have to add, uh, you know, that's where the and comes, right? So you give me an offering and, and you know, an improv, it's considered a gift, which is just another philosophy I'll get into later. The idea of thinking that everything somebody shares with you is a gift. The fact that you're talking with me is a gift. And that mindset alone hmm. uh, completely changed my outlook in life. You know, people answering an email is a gift and taking time out of your busy schedule is a gift. And every time you don't acknowledge that person's gift, you know, you're potentially hurting them. You know, they're, they're going out on a limb to share something with you. You know, hey, check out this riff, whatever. What is that, right? But when somebody offers you an idea and you go, oh, wow, I heard that and I can add this to it, no matter what you think. But then that's when you add your way of modifying the thing that's been shared. So all these ideas came together and I started really seeing how they could be applied to music and how 
they could potentially make me a better instructor, a better musician, a better producer. And it's been about a year and a half rabbit hole that I got into um, where I just kept taking classes and reading books and finding different ways to connect improv philosophy to what we do as trainers and musicians. And going back to the reaching out and during quarantine, it, it kind of felt like, well, I can't do this anymore because theaters are closed and you know nobody's participating in this activity. And I thought, well, I, I used to work um, tech because people love live and theater. I don't know if you've had any experience using live in theaters, but when you show up and you know how to use live in a theater production, it's like you showed a cave person fire almost. It's like, whoa, you can do all that <laughs> control like actual practical props on stage using robotics. And so everybody loves it. And that got me into this <clears throat> inadvertently got me into the world of working in theater. And I ended up doing some comedy shows. And then I ended up um, being the director of specialized tech for this like improv festival that happens in Austin called Out of Bounds, which is really fun. And in that festival, all these great improvisers from all over the world come and they're like very highly regarded and they'll give workshops. And one of them gave us his email after the workshop. So I was like, hmm, quarantine's happening. I bet he's not doing anything. It's a long shot because this guy is very, very, like he's got a lot of accomplishments in, in the world of comedy. He's never going to reply and write him. He's like, sure, let's do this. And, you know, neither he nor we knew how to work on Zoom. And it was this really cool discovery process with this very seasoned improviser. And we were sort of like helping each other figure things out. And then he turned out to be one of the most generous people we encountered, my, my improv friends and I, and uh, he started recommending us to these other amazing improvisers. So I've had this about like a year and six months of working with like, I don't know, like if I had to put it in music terms, like, you know, to in my opinion, Brian Eno level producers, like just, but in the, in the world of improv and, and they do really amazing things. Like not only, you know, the obvious TV writing and movie writing and stuff, but um, there's a thing, uh, an approach called applied improv, where they take the principles of improv and put it on the real world. Um, and a lot of them have this approach to that where you can really use these ideas and, and, and rules in like crisis negotiation and team building. Um, there's a chapter in a book called Applied Improvisation where they're using these principles in, in like youth detention centers at the border. Hmm. And all of these kids that have no sense of community because they're from all these different parts of the world and they're detained and they're feeling really negative, coming up with these activities to get them on the same page and build an instant community. And that's sort of one of the superpowers of being able to access that playfulness that we all have inherently inside of us is that once you activate it in yourself, you can activate it in others. And it's like the secret universal language. Hmm. That's pretty cool. I mean, because life is an improv, right? Like everything you're doing is basically improv. You're reacting to what's happening and you're trying to figure out what to do next. And we all know as much as you plan anything, like, guess what? That's when the curveball comes. And what are you supposed to do? And if you're too married to the plan, you know, good luck. You're going to freeze. You're going to get all upset. And um, to have that spirit of like playfulness even is a cool way to think of it too Just yeah it, I, you might appreciate knowing this it, it actually started the like improv as we know it i mean it's traced back to like commedia dell'arte like street performers in renaissance italy but mm -hmm. the improv as we know it sort of started um i think it was roosevelt in the new deal started funding all of these programs and they one of some of the programs that they funded were theater programs and this woman named Viola Spolin, um, developed a book and a program to go around the country teaching um, immigrant children how to assimilate to American culture. So like we were talking about this earlier, how do you teach kids that know a different language or they're coming in and they don't know the culture, different, you know, get them on the same page. So she came up with really basic like classroom play activities that she could use to teach kids vocabulary, teach kids to do things together, to enact scenarios so that words weren't needed and liter literacy wasn't dependent upon. Hmm. Uh, and then that, you know, snowballed into the art form that we know today. But it's really interesting for me to know that it's, it definitely always started with teaching in mind and getting people on the same page and, and actually not entertaining, which to me, entertaining is sort of a dirty word because it's uh, when 
when I think of it in Spanish, it like it breaks down into like keeping you in between. Like you're just being, you're not here nor there. You're not moving. You're not standing still. You're just in this like st stagnant state. And so, taking it beyond entertainment and turning it into a uh, culture building, community building, and even a way to overcome our limitations, you know, at, at the at the current moment by finding, you know, relying on our intuition relying on our listening skills and our just instinct as human beings to be able to get out of tricky situations. Hmm. That's cool stuff. It's probably something like we all should be doing, right? Like a little, a little learning, a little improv. Um, it, Cause when I first heard that expression, yes. And like whatever you tell me, like we're on a ship and a hurricane's coming I can't say, no, that's not a hurricane. Like, like, we're not on a ship. Something else. Give me something else, man. Like, now we're, like, out of the moment, as you said, right? But um, if I say, yes, oh, boy, it is. And, uh, and there's a hole in the deck or whatever. Um, we're, we're constantly building. And I think that's so important when you're playing music with other people. And I know in, like, my experience, the best... Um, like jams and players that I've, I've the most enjoyable experiences I've had are when we're just kind of going with whatever happens. And the most interesting things happen too, because you put something out there that I wouldn't have thought of doing. And if I think I don't like it and I reject it, then we never go down that road. But if I say, okay, let's see where this takes me. And then I'm now doing something different because I would have never done what you did. And then I give it back to you. All of a sudden, we're just on this uh, whole new place, and that's yeah. where a lot of the fun is. And I think it took me doing um, a lot of time on my own, actually. Like after like the band broke up one time, and I started actually focusing on like making music with the computer, electronic stuff that I could do by myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, having all that control was like at first great. You know, okay, I can do whatever I want now. But then playing with people again, it was like, well, the value in this is not controlling them. It's in working with what I get from them. And it's like a gift, like you said. Yeah. It's, That's it, why I'm constantly changing, chasing these challenges, like change, ch chasing ways to change my perception, changing ways to change my comfort level, because I did fall into this, I guess maybe a hole you could call it, or, 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 or this trap that I built for myself. And it sort of happened in Discovering Live many, many years ago and saying, whoa, I don't need anybody. I can do this by myself. Uh, I can control external instruments. I can loop myself. There's all these great, like, flexible things that I couldn't do before, and I was dependent on people. And then going down that, and it's totally great. I think, you know, exploring what you can do solo is amazing, but I think I sacrificed that, like, cognitive flexibility of saying, well, if there's a wrench thrown in my plan, I can surely adjust. And I think the more you go into your own, like I control everything, the harder it is for you to react in a positive, constructive way when something doesn't go right. Hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I can remember having this experience as a kid, actually, like um, ha hanging out with a friend, like when you're like really young, I think we were playing like Nintendo or something my friends that had like a brother or a sister were generally better at like sharing and playing along. But I, I remember one of my friends in particular, like I, I would go to hang out with them and he would just like show me all of his toys and he, he'd play with them and show me, isn't this cool? I'm like, yeah, cool. Let me, Oh no, let's do something else now. It was like, it was his show, you know? And and not to say like if you you know only child don't know how to play with people, but in this particular case, like it was kind of clear that that was just how he was brought up. You know, he wasn't he never had to like learn how to work with others. Um, I'm talking about like eight year old person right now. So you run a forty year old, thirty thirty year old, yeah, that never got over that like self centered worldview i think and it's not that this is a critique but i felt like i reached my limit with it with that worldview and my life was definitely showing me that i had reached a, a lot of limitations through that worldview and to take it back to improv i think one of the best 
he's uh, one of the best notes that I got from an instructor was um, his name's Rich Tallarico. He's also a, a the musician. He's like also a really accomplished guy, really thoughtful about improv and music. So when he saw that I was a musician, he explained it as a jazz band start. Right, every scene, everything you do as an improv is a jazz band start. You don't play the song you want to play. You play to complement the first thing that's already going on. Hmm. It's just, it really like once you break it down that way, it is very simplistic. Like I always thought improvisation was this really complex equation, and you need to know all this music theory and be thinking about it in real time. But at its best, is you're just listening what is there and how can you complement it? Okay, yeah. with complement it and like adding something to it, not saying that's great, you know. Yeah. Compliment, with, e. Compliment with two E's. With two E's. <laughs> Not the I. <laughs> and and once teacher. That, that mindset. <laughs> no, yeah, that's why. And that's how he says it too. Because it's, it's easy for us to, we always think of complimenting as just going, oh, doesn't your dress look nice? That's yeah. a really nice color on you or something. But that's sort of, to me, it's like a half, like a half gesture. You know, if you really want to, compliment somebody why don't you add it's that going back to that and right hey i see that you're dressed this way maybe you're dressed to the nines i'm going to dress to the nines to go out with you because i want to compliment your look hmm. i don't just want to say you look good and then not not be involved in the game we're playing right if the game is we're going to dress up and go have a nice dinner you know if that's the gift you're offering me i want to compliment that and that's sort of the mindset that i was missing before getting into all of this going hey somebody's inviting me to play music or somebody's inviting me to do something let's actually figure out what that means in the situation and like wholeheartedly jump into it and and really do that thing not what i think i should be doing and i don't know if i mean a lot of people probably relate to this where that are listening somebody invites you to make music and you automatically think of how it won't go right or you go like well they do this but i do that and Right away, that mindset's like blocking any creativity or any progress. But if you just go, sure, let's do that. And then you show up and they play something and you play something. And all of a sudden, you're both adjusting to each other. And, and so even in, in like relationship building terms, it's, there's a lot of good advice there to be mined. Yeah, that's uh, some of the like best experiences are when you're working with someone else like that. When they don't... They don't uh, see things the way you see it or or do things the way you do it or they have a different experience musically it's it's really nice to like see how you can fit into that situation and um yeah i think like improv is like a improvisational music can be really scary because uh i think it also kind of gets and this is sort of like the opposite of it too it, it kind of gets tied in with like soloing like yes. we're improvising or soul, which is like showing off in a lot of senses. Um, but you don't have to do it that way. You can, maybe you're just going to hit like something on beat two and play like one chord, dent, dent. And that it's not complicated, but it complements. It doesn't complicate it. It, uh, cause yeah, I think when I, I first uh, started thinking about like improvisation, I thought that meant I have to like solo over things and um, I would be doing that. But that's, um, you know, I guess that's one form. Yeah. And I mean, a big part of imp improv, not necessarily maybe music improvisation, is understanding the etiquette that, you know, if you're constantly taking up all the air in the room, then you're not really it's almost like a solo show and it's your show and you're controlling everything. Um, and, and that can lead to pretty disastrous situations. And it really like, you know, if you're putting yourself out there, if you're standing in, in a stay on, on a stage in front of people that you probably expect you to make them laugh or at least entertain them. And you have no idea what's going to happen. You really have no idea what's going on. The best tool you can rely on is your trust of each other. Right. And, and I think that's something that's, hard to build um, when it's not overtly stated, you know, Hey guys, let's build trust. How do we build trust? What are you feeling? That's not letting you take that like trust fall into our arms. And that's another thing that really enticed me. I love getting to like the down and dirty of like human behavior and relationships. And I love having deep conversations and a lot of what you need to face when like being comfortable as an improviser or somebody that's improvising an artistic form is trusting that 
whatever happens is going to happen and you still need to be the person doing the thing right so if you're i don't know if you've seen people you know paint austin had this for a while where like there'd be a music show there'd be live painting Mm -hmm. uh now there's people coding too there's all these different disciplines that cross together and they're happening in front of an audience and that my biggest takeaway from improv as a discipline was you keep doing the thing and the, the best you know the more you do it the more you're convincing the people that you are the person that's supposed to be doing the thing and the more you commit to doing it which is something else that's sort of lost in music that commitment of like you know this is how i do the thing and i'm going to commit through it uh, all the way basically regardless of detractors or criticism and you do see that every once in a while the people that stick to their guns and do the thing end up getting really amazing recognition sometimes i'm thinking of specifically of uh sparks i don't know if you saw that documentary that came out for the band sparks yeah they're um, they're kind of like a cult band and, and it's for those of the people that know cult, you know sparks they'll they don't need to know the story but there's this amazing documentary uh directed by edgar wright and it's a band that sort of had a really hard time in the mainstream and they had hits but then they didn't and it was because they always followed their instinct and and the guys had this very interesting visual aesthetic their videos were very like tongue in cheek you couldn't you didn't know if they were being taken seriously or if they were being maybe mocking music a little bit but the point of the documentary is that after i think 28 albums and almost 50 years making music all of the people that are singing their praises are music makers like they might have not made it big with the audience but like Beck was a big fan of theirs. Um, Jack Antonoff was was another big fan of theirs. Like all these people that made huge impacts in music, cite mm. Sparks as an influence. So it's that thing of I, what I took away from that documentary is they did their thing and they committed to it, and they obviously changed and adapted to the times and soundscapes, but they were always following their like trust of each other and their trust of their vision, despite all the detractors and all the criticism. And, and in the end, to me, that's more of a fulfilling maybe life or maybe career where, you know, you could have had adoration or you could have made an impact. And, and I feel like making an impact going back earlier to like what you're doing with your podcast and your packs and how you impact people. That is very admirable in my book because you're actually, you know, putting something out there into the world that people can make their visions happen with like tools that people can use to actually uh, maybe even just feel comfortable going oh they're like me or i'm like them mm -hmm. um, david burns said in, in i think in a book the how how music is made or how music works book how music works i think yeah great the book yeah yeah awesome book and he talks about how like when when you put out music you're like raising a signal and saying hey i'm like this are you like this too? And if you are, you're not alone. I'm here. Hmm. And it feels like a very David Byrne concept, especially from like the time that he was making, he was emitting those signals to like follow the, the metaphor. But it, that really impacted me in saying like, what are the signals that I'm putting out? And what are, who are the people that I want to attract and let them know that they're not the only ones like that? Hmm. You know, I just watched something about two hours ago. Um, What's it called? It's on Netflix. Uh, I think it's called This Is Pop or This Is Pop Music or something. And it's like... Uh, T-Pain? Yeah, the T-Pain one is the one I was thinking of. It was about, well, it was about auto-tune. And T-Pain was like a main person they interviewed, uh, you know, because he definitely uh, got known for that sound. Um, the fun part that happened a little later is he did like an NPR concert, NPR Tiny Desk, and he sang and he's a great singer. It's, which is awesome, like vindication at the end. But uh, he was talking about how, like, um, you know, he got known just for that, just for like the auto tune guy. And he even mentioned like Usher, <laughs> like pulled him aside and said, You're ruining music, man. You got to stop this. <laughs> like Usher said that to him, you know, you, like you're ruining it for singers or something like that. And that like really upset him. Um, but his like, uh, his attitude now is, um, you know, I'm making music for myself, what I like. And if you don't like it, it's not for you. 
I didn't make it for you. But if you do like it, you know, welcome to the club, he said. That was like kind of a cool way to look at it. Like, you know, if it's not for you, it's not for you. But if you like it, you're in, you're, you're with me now. And, um, it, it, uh, yeah, poor guy. I, f- I really felt for him, you know, cause like he got like villainized for auto tune. And meanwhile, like he, you know, influenced a lot of other artists to actually use it that and are it's, seen as more it's, legitimate artists. Yeah. It's literally everywhere. I was watching a Rick Beato critique on, on auto tune recently too. And I, I'm not against it. I think people are using it creatively really in, in amazing ways. It's also, you know, forced us as technologists to find ways to use it live, right? Because then it's on the record and people aren't able to pull it off live. And then now recently, you know, a lot of bands are using auto-tune real time. And um, it's pretty cool. And I just, that that always, it's kind of funny to me how that's the history of music, right? Like they play a specific type of music or like the whatever's established and somebody comes along and is like, hey, put that loot down, check this out. This is a guitar. And like, no, what, what the hell is that? We play yeah. loot, you know, <laughs> music is all about the loot, you know, the guitars are not real music and blah, blah. And then yeah. music gets electrified and it's like, no, no, no. And I remember uh, I grew up uh, on the Mexican U.S. border and in that part of the world, there's a lot of like international commerce. So there's a lot of warehouses. And I remember going to uh, a friend of mine's warehouse his or his dad's warehouse to go um, just jam as kids because, you know, we had pissed off all the parents and nobody wanted us to make noise at their house. So I just go to the warehouse and, and bother the box. So we were playing <laughs> in the warehouse and out of nowhere, these three adults, we were like, you know, 16, 15, these adults show up and they're just kind of eyeballing us. And that was weird. So we stopped and acknowledged them and they come over and they start talking shit. They're like, oh, you got all those pedals. Everybody's using pedals now. Back in my day, you know, if we wanted a tremolo effect. We used to like have to pinky the volume knob. And if we wanted to get a chorus, we would detune the chords a little bit with our fingers and bent them a little bit. And I was like, wow, that's cool. That's great. I wish I could do that too. But, you know, why hate on technology? And it just seems like that's always the case. And I don't know if it's, you know, also with music genres where you get old and you go, and I never, I hope I never get that way where you just start trash talking younger music. But I don't know if it's like a fear based thing. I don't know if it's an insecurity. I don't know if it's just, maybe a human condition where we just are so set on what music is or what this definition of something is. Then when something new comes along, we go, Nope, because somebody already told me it's this other thing. Mm-hmm. It kind of confounds me. Yeah. That sounds like it sucks to have to do a tremolo with like your pinky <laughs> finger on the volume. Knob. <laughs> but when you do like um, a Jeff Beck, I don't know if you've ever seen any of his live sets and he's doing all of those cool, like, you know, old school guitar effects. It's like, well, it's, you know, it has its place, but why would I not also want to combine that with like a tremolo pedal? Cause you're right. It's like, you know, your pinky's only so fast and yeah. you can't think your pinky necessarily to like a global tempo and still play. And, still yeah. Play. yeah. I think it's kind of crazy to like take a stance, like I'm against this new technology. Cause guess what? It's here. Like you, it's, it's happening now. I can understand being like against certain uses of it maybe for whatever reason like um you know there's so many people i would never want to hear auto-tuned of course you know like no just let neil young sing like you know he he's got a thing it's good <laughs> um i wouldn't want to quantize you know just thinking of rick beato like john bonham like he did that video quantizing john bonham and it was like obvious and uh i i another guy i love on youtube uh dr bob i i I just had him on the podcast and um he did a video where he quantized van halen running with the devil and and like you just realize like in a way like van halen's almost like a punk band and how much their song breathes and when he tightens it up it's just like you you can almost like mentally hear the click Mm -hmm. in there and uh it's un- it's unfortunate, but there are other times when that stuff is like really appropriate. Like on the dance floor, the four to the floor, it's like it's it actually is nice when it's super quantized. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alex Van Halen, if you listen to just any isolated drum track, it's really interesting the way like there's this back and forth air, like almost what people try to create with like sidechain compression and then production techniques, and he was doing it just with his hands and how he played the song. It's really yeah. interesting. 
Yeah, like, you know. We, um, we can do that too, by the way. Like we go, you know, we invent the tremolo pedal and then we automatically forget that we can use the volume knob, which right. is, that is sort of maybe what pisses people off about it, right? Like, let's at least not forget that there's this other thing that we can sing like Neil Young, that not everybody has to be T-Pain now just because it's post autotune. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to know the time and the place, I think, is is the trick. Um, and, and sometimes it's, you definitely hear stuff where you're like, why did they do that, you know? Or why didn't they do that? <laughs> but um, you, the technology, it's a reality, you know? The, the, and it's going to keep changing. It's going to keep evolving. And it's going to get more uh, transparent. And there's going to be new things that come out that we're not even thinking of that are going to be offensive to us in some other way if if we close our minds to it but i think to have an open mind to the stuff as as artistic tools um as the gift as you said you know okay we have auto tune yes and what can we do with it and right. um when i first downloaded auto tune um i i started um putting it on my voice and singing into it live and i was like oh this is really helping me like find melodies you know, mm -hmm. I might not, I was playing my guitar and singing. I was like, I might not want this on this song, but it's kind of helping me like find notes and different like uh, harmonies that I wouldn't have come up on my own. Just, uh, you know, as a guy that's not really a very good singer, you know? And um, it, it was a pretty cool tool for that, for songwriting. You know, whether it actually makes it on the, the record or not, it helped me find certain melodic things I probably wouldn't have done normally. So for that, I was like, this is great. That's another yeah. thing, too. I, I like technology as scaffolding. And then you can remove the scaffolding, and the final structure is all that's left, right? And I think, I mean, even I forget it, uh, uh, despite me teaching it to people all the time, that, you know, like, just because you don't want to beat in the song doesn't mean you wouldn't benefit from starting with a really simple beat that just guides everything mm. and then you mute it or you delete the track and everything just falls into place and locks together really well. And I think what you, the example you illustrated with autotune is a great example of that is just use it to get to where you need to get. And then again, let's not forget that we can do it the old way too, just because there's this new thing. It's not a, we're not being forced into the future. We're being invited, you know, <laughs> into the future and to use whatever available there yeah it's it was almost like um a metronome in a way but for pitch where and it showed taught me a lot about like how off key i was i was like oh look at how much it has to correct my notes and helped me see like where i was and and i think that's a lot like if i was just playing drums to a metronome where maybe like when we play live as the band we don't want to have the metronome on but it's pretty interesting to, I'm just recently playing with a couple of my friends recording music. We were recording to the metronome, we're all in headphones. And once we start playing these songs that we've been working on for the last few months with the metronome on, it's like, oh, this is interesting. You know, I, I obviously speed up here because I'm like holding myself back now. And it just gives a different perspective and it helps you fine tune it. So it's that yeah. trope of um, like the J.K. Simmons drum teacher from that movie, or like you know the the stereotype of the really strict piano teacher that's not going to let you slide easy or like get off easily. I think there's always been a benefit to that. I think it's not the right approach to teach people, and it's very discouraging. But that's what a click and auto tune are. They're just very unforgiving guides that tell you, "Hey, man, I'm sorry, I'm I'm 118 BPM, and you're all over the place." There's no denying it, and you can. Yeah. There's certain ways that we can dilute ourselves into thinking I'm doing it right, but it's not until we reference ourselves, you know, either like, you know, traditionally like with a mix or listen to our music. But I think that that click, when people start introducing clicks into live performance, I get so excited because even if they're not playing tracks, even if they're just, or even if the drummer's just playing to a click, it tightens up the entire show, uh, let alone opening it up now for like synchronizing lights and you know, s synchronizing effects and having everything like so much more streamlined, but it's like, yeah, just playing to a click makes everybody tighter. It does. Um, 
it, you know, it's not without its own cost. You know, you don't get that like emotional increase at the chorus or that kind of like backing off as we get into the like chill section of the song. You know, that can get lost. And um, I, I'm at odds with it sometimes. Like, um, you know, I'm as you know, I'm I have no problem playing in the grid and loops and <laughs> you know any of that stuff. But uh, sometimes when I see a concert and it's a band and it's there's clearly like backing tracks. Um, I, I, I do feel a little uneasy sometimes depending on how it's done where I'm like, I don't know what I'm even hearing anymore. Like, <laughs> like I'm hearing stuff that is clearly not being played and it makes me wonder, are they, am I actually hearing what they're playing or is that a track too? You know, what, what is actually going on there? And that can be, I guess like maybe that's where a lot of people have their issues with things like auto tune and quantizing is like the um deception of it. <laughs> you know like like what are, are you fooling me? Like what am I really hearing? My my whole thing with that is I think that's because it's Brian Funk in the audience. Or yeah, me. probably, right? I, I bands like, you know, you're when we're starting to create a live setup and they, if they're feeling that same apprehension. And I totally recognize it because when I was in loop 2018, there was a lot of artificial intelligence and composition using technology. And, and it was the hot topic. Everybody was talking about it. And I came away, like my answer to all of it, because at the end they had this, I think it was called the Nile Project. And it was a lot of musicians from all over the Nile River. So spanning the entire continent of Africa, and they formed a band. And I was like, you know what? I just watching them learn that AI, of course, can do anything. Technology, of course, can do anything. I expect it. But to see another human being do something that I can't do is, is what really, like, I don't know, what, what's, what elevates it, right? So when I see somebody doing that in, in a live setting, uh, finding that balance of, like, what is the real and what is the not real? Because I, I do see, like, the, the, the value of a live musician playing, and it's, it's a lot more impressive um, but then when you have the tracks, it's the, it is that compromise that you're talking about of um, what are we hearing and, and, and what are they doing? But I think there is, there is room for it to be a lot more flexible. I think we, we tend to go like really far in one direction or another. And again, going back to my original point, we judge it based on what we would think if we were watching that, right? Like the majority of music consumers, um, and this is like the ignorance is bliss example right they have no idea what's going on they're just at a show and they're just mm -hmm. so happy to be out of the house and have a drink in their hand and they feel the bass and everybody's having a good time and they're like hell yeah this is whatever this band is supposed to be and this is what music is supposed to be but there's like one percent of that audience is you and me and i'm always just looking at the pedal boards i'm looking at you know you know what's going on backstage is there an ableton tech is the drummer running the show and uh, I geek out on that and I can see where it, <clears throat> it becomes a little like maybe disappointing or it, it's almost like the Wizard of Oz, like you see the, you see the man yeah. behind the curtain. But it's also, I try to find the admiration of going, wow, they're brave because they're, you know, a lot of people don't have, they don't want to try tracks or they don't want to try technology. And sometimes even seeing a technical issue on stage is one of my new favorite things because people either freak out and the show stops or maybe even ends but there's this new like perception of it where people are so comfortable with technology that it's just like a guitar string popping. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, you know, shows before, a guitar string popping wouldn't stop the show. It just meant they had to solo a different way and play the chords in a different order. And it was so exciting seeing them sweat it a little bit. And I always tell people, you know, as we're building your show and building this technology, just know, trust that something's going to go wrong, but that, that just going to it's going to put the focus on you in a positive way. So you still have instruments, you still have a microphone, there's still amplification, something can come out of this. The worst thing you can do, and it's sort of another princ uh, improv principle is like, something goes wrong, you don't go, oh wait, no, I thought we were on a boat and there was a storm coming. You just kind of go with it and, and keep it going. So I, I, I try to find that admiration for people using technology and saying like, you know, you're trying something different, you're trying to give added value to your show. But I, I still totally see your point of that, maybe a sacrifice or like a trade-off of the, the old school humanity. Yeah. I think, I guess everything comes with a cost. Right. And I mean, I love the, the potentials like we have for live performance and 
all these things we can do on stage is is wild, you know. Um, and as you said too, I'm I'm me as a, someone that thinks about this stuff. Like, and this is something I always talk about when we're talking about like mixing your track or recording your parts. It's like, guess what? Ninety percent of people only hear the vocal. <laughs> that's that's it. There's music and there's the vocal. That's there's two tracks in this song: music and vocal, <laughs> and that's it to most people so like you sweating about like the hi-hat like whatever tapping that most people aren't going to hear but you you know you have to go through those details to make your product what you want it to be so i'm the person in the audience like you looking around like oh, what are they doing over there what kind of how come i don't see any amplifiers on stage you know <laughs> like and, uh, temper are they using vst yeah it's um it's maybe I guess like for me I just like I kind of just if I would just know what I'm if you told me I'd be okay with everything but it's when I can't tell I'm like like, what am I I know this could all be just a backing track altogether what am I really hearing like I like knowing that but I think think, yeah go ahead I'm sorry I was just gonna say I think it's um part of human nature right like tell me what I'm consuming Uh, I don't want to be surprised later on and sometimes you see it with food products or things that are like a cigarette that are not necessarily healthy for you. People know that and they go like, okay, I'm choosing to <laughs> accept this circumstance. Uh, but where if you just go like, hey, or try this, it's like, well, what is it? No, no, just try it. Uh, tell me what's in it. And even if you would have normally consumed it, it just, I feel like that's um, part of human nature. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's one thing to like, know that this cigarette might relax me or whatever you know cigarette's supposed to do but i also know it it will kill me in 20 years if i stick with it as opposed to like here you go try this wasn't that fun oh guess what's gonna kill you (laughs) like that's like hey man (laughs) you know what the hell so there's a little bit of that but i think with all of this stuff you know um it's to get mad about it I think is counterproductive because if all the music is being quantized now and if everything's being tuned and all the shows are to the click with a backing track, that leaves an opportunity for you now to stand out and not do that. How about you don't do it? And then like, see, see how that goes. And uh, that can be the thing like you kind of occupies yourself. It, it, it leaves an opening, you know, and it, it makes it uh, special when you hear it and, let people understand why you have such a problem with like all of this other stuff because um like this is the feature of this song that it's not to the click that we're not auto-tuning like this is the raw like guts of the song on the floor for you to like pick up and play with (laughs) as opposed to the polished thing that everyone else is doing so that's that can be your thing if you think of uh, punk being a reaction to disco and how that supposedly was like the most polished music could get. And it's like so loose and organic compared to today's music. Just imagine a 14 year old boy or girl right now. And all they know is quantize. All they know is perfect pitch. Imagine like like punched to the gut. They're going to feel when they make sloppy music or when they hear, you know, that artist you're describing buck the trend and go, no, no, no. Music can also be this. Music can be dangerous Mm -hmm. and it can be unpredictable and, and hard to follow. I think that's setting up people for a really cool, I don't want to call it a wake up call, but maybe just like a really cool experience of awakening and going, whoa, I thought music was this. Because I think we've all had that when you, you know, it could be, I think you do this a lot where you record your new experience with a device or a new toy or a new instrument because you want to capture that state of play going back to that improv thing. Hmm. Um, We have all felt that when you find the right tool or you hear the right band, you get this tingly feeling and and it's almost like everything stops and it's just this thing and you. And I feel like, I hope potentially that thing you described of people going off grid and people just making more human music is, is really going to be just like a, an amazing shock to somebody's system in, in the best way. And they're, it's going to make them explore music and, 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 and really entice them to go out and do it and, and just not care about perfect pitch not care about perfect quantization and you know like 
music theory even because i think that's <clears throat> that's one of the bigger hang hang-ups right now is you get these people that understand music theory but they don't really know how to just like jam and like cut loose musically or communicate with other people musically if they don't have a structure and then there's people that have that instinct but are intimidated by music theory and i think both of those extremes prevent you from creating um but accepting that I need to find this middle ground where I'm trusting this non-technological, just human instinct of this is what the note being played or the harmony that's laid down sounds like. This note sounds horrible. Let me not play that note. Let's play the note, you know, that sounds good. And you kind of find that. And to me, that's a really interesting way to bypass music theory because I, that was one of my bigger hangups. I don't know if it happened to you, but then later realizing music theory is more prescriptive. Like you, you, you really, it's most useful to describe something after the fact. Like, I don't think, unless you're composing, arranging, you're just like playing with somebody. I don't want to think in music theory and formulas. I want to just react and feel, but it, at the same time, it's going to be grounded in it sounding good. So by the time somebody listens to it and explains it through music theory, there'll be all of these amazing connections and points that can make like those Rick Beato videos most of the time, like one of the, my favorite ones, I think was lithium by Nirvana. He does a Nirvana song is like, you know, how Kurt Cobain was singing the, I think it was like the fourth or something and his melody. And he was just kind of like creating a chord between his power chord and then adding his vocal and maybe not really intending it, but it probably sounded really cool to him and it moved him mm -hmm. and it could be later explained through music theory. And when done that way, to a non-music theory or a music theory illiterate person, then you go like, well, I could never be Kurt Cobain because I couldn't think of that. And it's like, no, you don't get it. He wasn't thinking about it either. He was just doing something that sounded good to him. This academic you know, s situation is requiring it to be broken down into theory. So um, I feel like that's another maybe obstacle that we present for ourselves, like, like technology, like perfection, that it needs to adhere to this mold of what music theory or what we think music theory should be. Yeah, I, I saw that video. I th or I saw one, I, maybe he did more than one. I think it was Smells Like Teen Spirit. He was going over. Um, he might have done more than, than that. But um, yeah, just that idea, like the question was there, like, did he know that what he was doing? Does it matter though? Um, I don't know if you would do that if you knew what you were doing. <laughs> and something like that's been kind of funny happening in the last few months playing with some of my buddies is um, as I'm like kind of like looking at the songs we're writing, there's been a few times where I'm like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> we just changed key or we, you know, we weren't really supposed to do that note. This note I'm singing, I just realized is not really what I, I thought we were in D major, but we're really only in, we're like in, you know, F sharp minor. And um, it's like, and because I was like almost wrong when we go to the other part, we changed key because I, I I had it mixed up in my head, but because I didn't realize what I was singing, you know, I didn't realize I was hitting this one note that took us in this other key. And then when you look back at it, it's like, well, that's pretty clever. But it, it was actually just what happened. It was what we were doing, what we were hearing and what we were feeling. And, and uh, if you would have started from that point and like mapped it out, you probably would have been more apprehensive to go in that direction because it's quote unquote wrong, right? It wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done it on purpose, <laughs> you know. Um, but in in looking back at it, I was like, "Oh, look at that!" You know, we were actually playing in this key. That's it happened really when I was starting to like write like lead guitar parts, and I was like, "Something's just not right." And then I, um, the key I was playing in, it was just like subtly off. So, hey, you know, yeah. That's and you listen. That's that's. I think we forget that music is. Like we're only supposed to engage it mainly with our ears, even though you know, we've got computer screens and we can intellect intellectualize it. But mm. solutions just listening, right? If this note doesn't sound good, just find the one that sounds good. And once it sounds good, that's the note. Yeah. Uh, maybe we're simplifying it, but I think overcomplicating it is just as problematic. Um, if if you, because then it becomes this insurmountable task, right? Like finding 
the perfect way to line everything up as opposed to just going, I don't like this. Let me find something that I do like and just navigating um, through your ears. Yeah, I have a th suspicion and I haven't studied the like history of music theory, like how it developed and when we came up with what, but I have a suspicion that a lot of the things that we have names for, we have names for like after the fact that it was done, not like um, you know, oh, we could do like a tritone substitution here, you know, so let's see what that sounds like. I think probably people did that and then we needed a name for it. Yeah. You that know? sounds, that sounds like a great episode too, by the way, is, is like the history of music theory or something like that. I, I once heard that, um, in the Renaissance, all of these disciplines were becoming, um, I guess, put, being put through the scientific process. So mathematics, sciences, even literature and writing were becoming more uh, structured and established, and music and art were feeling left behind as not worthy pursuits. Mm -hmm. So that forced a lot of people to create these rules and create these institutions that governed the right and the wrong way and the academic approach to music. So that's sort of the beginning of the rules that we now know and in Western music theory. And this is just something I overheard. It may or may not be correct. I'd love if somebody would chime in and, and maybe correct us in the notes or in the comment well, section. We have a caller online too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a commenter. <commentary. But> yeah, <laughs> it makes sense to me because it just feel academic more so than, and like you're saying, like to, to describe something that somebody did, like what was that? You know, mm. he did, he was moving his pink, his volume knob with his pinky. Oh, we'll call that a tremolo. Well, do you think um, the idea of yes and, where you go along with it and you add to it in improv, do you think people came up with that first? Or do you think we were having some good improvs and we realized it's because you said yes and added to it? Or, it. or like uh, if you're drawing like a particular brush stroke or painting or whatever, you know, did, did we have that first and then give a name to it or somebody did it and says, you know what, that's the, uh, I don't have the terminology here ready for that, but <laughs> you know, the, now that we have a name for it, I, I, I guess, I don't know what the answer is, but it's funny because like a lot of art has so much technique and sometimes science really behind it. Like a lot of music is like mathematical as much as it is emotional, but did we kind of like do the math after we put the notes together or or did we do the math and then we said okay then we could do this i'm a believer in, in the thing happening first and then somebody being smart enough to recognize it and say well when it went right we were doing this or i mean i know people one of the the lessons that's been down passed down to me is whenever you do an improv set if you can record it then you can transcribe it. And if you can transcribe it, you can see every word you said. And it's so painful, man, like listening to your own voice and then writing your dumb words as you're saying them in the moment. It just feels so humiliating. But on the other side of it, you come out with a lot of information and, and knowing where, especially if something was successful saying, oh, you know, the words that came up the most was I know. That's another it's kind of like another tenant of improv is choosing to know, choosing to care about the thing, right? You give me the example of like, you know, we're on a lifeboat and there's a storm coming. I know. And that's how I like continue your thing. So it's not so much about um, agreeing and yesing. It's about not negating. And that's sort of tricky to understand for a lot of people because they think they need to say yes to the thing, right? So if you say, you know, um, get the cat, the house is on fire, right? You're already telling me what's going on. I can still say, forget the cat, grab the jewelry or something, you know, whatever. I'm still not negating that we're on fire, that the cat needs to be rescued. But in my saying no, I may be adding my point of view of like, well, maybe my point of view is less cat centric and more jewelry centric or whatever, you know, example you can come up with. But I think people started noticing that like, if you're, if you're, if the purpose is to build an instant community or if the purpose is to build um, a scene or a play out of nothing, then the best way to get there is to get on the same page and agree because if we start devolving into bickering or argument first of all nobody really wants to watch that but then we're at odds 
and it's it's never going to be constructive. It's always just going to either be at a standstill or spiral into like nothingness and just kind of like the dark side of humanity where we're just trying to convince. And that's another word that I didn't know was so loaded. But in improv, you never want to convince people. You never want to say, no, dude, really get the cat, forget the jewelry. You just want to accept that I'm the type of person who wants to get the jewelry and you're the type of person who wants to get the cat when the <laughs> house is on fire. And what are, what's the dynamic between those two people? Hmm. And that's when it gets interesting because it's like at odds and the house is on fire and we're arguing about what do we get first. So finding ways to creative ways to support while still keeping things interesting and not just kind of going through the motions, which is another applicable thing to music, right? It's still accepting that, okay, he's laying down maybe like a, a, a bebop beat, but I can get creative and do some fusion. I don't necessarily have to play a bebop riff. And then that's when you're not negating, but you're not just blanket saying, sure, I'll accept everything you're doing at face value without my filter. I guess the musical equivalent of all of that is turning your amp up. <laughs> and I'll, turn up my amp. I'll hit my drums harder. That's funny though, because if uh, the idea of like just kind of jumping in and being in that moment, you're right. If the house is burning down, get the cat is what you said to me. For me to go, oh my God, you're right. The house is, unless that's the character I'm playing, like, oh, <laughs> I didn't even know I'm, I'm absent minded or something. But it's it's very unnatural. To do, so, oh yes yes the house is <laughs> unless that's the point um so to just say forget the cat you know get the jewelry is and that's i guess a good way to kind of think about it with music too it's it, just accept the reality of it like yeah and uh reality is i guess pretty flexible anyway <laughs> <laughs> it's all uh, our perception but um yeah, that's a cool way to put it. Um, I could see how this translates, you know, not just to, you know, doing a, a quality improv set, but also just in so many other things where you gotta just get aboard and, and go for the ride. Yeah, you stumbled into something, or you, you reminded me of something that I wanted to bring up with you and get your thoughts on this. Um, I had a really hard time justifying just art in general in my life, like music or creativity, because I grew up in a very, like, uh, just a, a world that's like more concrete, maybe, or more like facing just like the day to day thing. So, mm -hmm. like, more uh, abstract. Um, I think I know what you're saying. Like, um, it's very easy to see like art and music as not being like practical stuff yes, you know like it's not uh okay so since i started doing um putting out my packs teaching um and basically making a little bit of money doing some musical stuff even if it was like nothing it, I'm, I'm at least contributing a little bit to it it made me feel like if i was then gonna go do some music it, it it like it's more justified you know like i'm going to work i can almost like use the excuse i'm i'm, I'm doing some work now i got to make this pack you know and uh and meanwhile it's like it's very easy for me to look at that and just be like i'm tinkering around i'm fooling around i'm playing too much i'm not um i, I maybe that is of what you're getting at nailed it it's exactly that and what i came to understand for myself personally is that the benefit of art and even like having to justify it to a school system right a school system that constantly guts arts programs is that and, and you alluded to it in improv it's that um art is a safe training ground for real life you can really you know learn about problem solving and, and conflict and all of these different things without or even just creativity and accessing your creative side and, and being open to new ideas. That's something where um, improv really helped me. And, and um, what reminded me was you were talking about how, you know, somebody would just say, yes, and the house is on fire, which is unnatural. But the great thing about improvisation is that you, you know, that's a beginner status. So you always keep learning and, and um, it has developed in such a way that when you learn improv, you start doing things very overtly. And you start really, really just talking unnaturally. 
But mm. then that's only to build the muscle of going, yeah, you're accepting this and you're not trying to act normal or you're not trying to be yourself. You're trying to find an interesting point of view or you're trying to, you know, bounce off of the other person. So to me, that is a perfect example of how art can sort of create this scaffolding to go like, hey, the real way to get to agreement is just blanket say yes, but not really. There's nuances to it. But if we just start with the nuances, nobody will get there to the place of just experiencing saying yes and in a very literal way. Uh, so once that's maybe like a training wheel that's taken off, then you can find a way to say no while saying yes. And then you find ways to keep the thing going without sacrificing too much of your humanity or your uniqueness, because that's what's going to make it special, right? You can just agree to whatever musical offering is happening and sort of be wrote about it and just play it. But it's not until you go, oh man, I wish I could put this twist on it right now. And you do it. You, you kind of follow your instinct and everybody turns around. They're like, whoa, did you just like, yeah, I just did that. And then it gives you that encouragement of its you know, immediate feedback. Let me do it again. Mm. Let me do it again. And maybe you do it and people turn around with a different face and you learn, oh, I crossed this line. I shouldn't have done that. And it's all life skills. Maybe, you know, it's a term that we and I, you and I can identify with working in schools. Like life skills usually has this loaded meaning, but we all need life skills and we all benefit from at any point in our lives having this refresher of going, hey, let's dust stuff our life skills and find out new ways to be conducive to making things happen. Really, it's, it's what it all boils down to. Not, not being the type of person that digs their heels and goes, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do this kicking and screaming and it's going to be unpleasant for everybody. You know, it teaches you to be the type of person that goes with it because you know that whatever's on the other side, you're still going to be yourself and you're going to depend on your abilities to get you through it. And there's nothing more comforting than just going, yeah, I got this. Even if I don't got this, it's fine because that's the point. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to do the thing. Hmm. Yeah, th there are a lot of life lessons, I think playing music with other people taught me a lot about like ego and um because i can remember in the earlier days you know you play like a little riff and someone says eh, i don't think that works here and you're like oh my god <laughs> like i'm a bad person i you don't like my music you don't like how i play and you know how many times do musicians go through that with other musicians where you either can't tell them or if you do it ruins the entire relationship um but then to get to the point where you just kind of realize like, oh, it's, that's just a collection of notes I played. And they might even have just been at the wrong time. It might not even be the wrong notes. Who knows? But it's not me, you know? And uh, to, to know like your role, to know like what part I'm playing in the song. Maybe this song sounds better if I just hit the tambourine three times in the chorus. And then I just stand out. And, and the whole is better. I think you get that in like sports too. And mm -hmm. I think sports is another thing you can kind of trivialize real fast. If you just say, oh, you're bouncing your ball around, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that seems important. Good contributions. You know, you can do the same thing you do with music. Like, oh, you're making your silly songs on your guitar again, huh? But think of like what you learn like about life playing on a team or, or about like... Um, working hard, training, practicing, sucking at something, and then seeing yourself get a little better. I mean, that's, that's so empowering. Um, I definitely got that from music because when I started playing guitar, I was 14, I didn't know anything about music. I remember the first time I tried to sing along to a track. This was like before I knew that singers were singing notes. Like I just didn't know that. It seems like funny to not yeah. know that, but I didn't know that. I got one of those too. When I got my first guitar, I had just seen people play guitar on TV and I, uh, I didn't know you had to press on the frets. I just thought you put your finger and went like this. <laughs> That's how <laughs> self hot I am. <laughs> yeah, right. Like some of these yeah. like super basic, obvious things that, you know, a month later, do you, you forget how little you knew, but to see like that growth happen is valuable. And I think it, made me like okay with not being good at stuff because we're we're cool with that when we're really young like we can't walk but we fall down until we can and there becomes a point somewhere 
and it's young. It's it's probably like middle school age, you know, ten years old maybe. If you're not like good at something naturally, like you just it, very often at least people will say like, oh, I'm not artistic. I'm not creative. I'm not athletic. I'm whatever. I'm not good at math. Yeah. This and just like funny. blanket statement, like your yeah. fate is sealed. Sorry, it's a, it's funny because the both for sports and music, the verb is to play. And somehow yeah. we still manage to turn kids off and to make them get really critical and judgmental and go, no, this is not for me. Even though it's P-L-A-Y is the thing. And, and we're not doing it. We're making it work and we're making it rote and boring and regimented. And that's why I love working in, in an Ableton trainer capacity, creating uh, youth music education programs, because that's another really cool area to teach people how to you know, overcome that ego thing of like, how do you give because right, that, that situation you presented of a band member not liking your riff, maybe that band member could have also benefited from knowing how to give constructive feedback, right? Because, you know, 16-year-old versions of ourselves maybe weren't the most, um, you know, supportive in, in the way we would give feedback. Dude, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's lame. <Yeah. laughs> okay, I'll, I won't play it anymore. But yeah, see, and, and like, I, I love music programs in school or at least what i'm trying to do with music programs is get away from that and through ableton anybody can make music especially with learning music and learning synth and like these you, you can catch people at such a specific age where they're not really thinking that making music is impossible it's just another class or just another activity and you sit them down and they have to collaborate and make music with somebody and they also have to critique it and maybe swap and do remixes and things like that and you can see that um, maybe apprehension at first the, that, that you're, they're anticipating butting heads, but once you teach them certain rules of how to handle those situations, it, it mm. feels like it's, it's so undeniable that that's the best way to do something like that, right? Because we've all experienced that negative feedback of like, that sucks. And for some kids, it's their parents or, or like somebody that shouldn't be talking to them like that, like putting them down. So they're already showing up in a classroom and they're waiting for somebody to be negative or to find a critique. And we were talking about it earlier too. Sometimes teachers are not great at talking to kids or, or knowing how to relate to them. So they have this chip on their shoulder. And I think as teachers in a, in a, in a creative field or music teachers, we almost have this responsibility of being the antidote to that because we can be the antidote to that, especially if it's an after school thing or something that's not tied to expectations of a school district yeah. because there's no i guess there's there's no risk to it first of all but then there's nothing like experiencing this new world as a child and going into this place that's so anti what you're used to but at the same time supportive and the same time safe you know just like a school but without the hang-ups and i think that's when learning really starts to happen hmm. yeah the I mean, like in my classes, my regular English classes, like no one chose to be there, you know, yeah. and um, it, it can, if you go in there day in and day out, you can be convinced like this is just what like teenagers are like, you know, they're miserable, they have an attitude. Well, you're catching them in like this environment they don't want to be in or, or maybe who knows what's going on outside of the class, the friends, the social circle. But I, I when I do... Um, the club or um even uh we we haven't done it in two years now but uh we do this like uh night where um it's sort it's almost like an open mic they, they have to like try out for it but really the tryout is just making sure they're actually serious about doing it <laughs> you know you'll get on i just want to make sure you're not gonna just say you're whatever but uh, i mean to see them in like outside of that in those like situations it's, it's really nice it's and it's different and you realize that they are actually round, complex characters. They're not just, it's so easy to, I think it's like a feature really of us as people. Like we categorize things, we, we stereotype, we, we, you know, we make judgments on people, their entire existence based on like one decision they made in the split second. Oh, that guy, what a piece of garbage he is. You know, he did that guy that stopped you in the car at the coffee shop. What a jerk. God, what a miserable existence he must live. That that's 
not even a fraction of a percent of his entire life. Mm-hmm. And um, I say maybe that's a feature because probably it helped us survive in the past because it kept us away from danger, but um, it, it doesn't really work so well in our world now where we're not in constant, uh, you know, our lives aren't in danger. We're not, I'm not waking up in the morning wondering if I'm going to survive. Yeah. You know, so um, it's, it, it's nice when your, your sort of instinctual assumptions are like turned upside down and you realize that well, yeah, every other person is just as complicated as you are. All the crazy experiences you've had, the stuff that goes on in your head all the time, as complex as you are, that's how every other person is. I think we can access that as artists or we should be able to access that mindset as artists more so than like civilians to call them something. Uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, it, it's definitely a muscle that we should have at the ready and it's hard to be empathetic, but empathy, I think is that solution of not judging the person by those, you know, five, that five minute interaction in a parking lot. And um, I was sharing with you, I've definitely had my dust ups in life and, uh, back when I was very self-centered and, and maybe more egotistical about you know what I was doing with my life, um, I had a wake-up call that I was sharing with you earlier about my my parents becoming ill and, and losing them to cancer, and it, they happened at the same time. It was kind of this felt like a catastrophe, felt like a tragedy in real yeah. time, but you don't really have time to process it because you're putting out fires and, and you're helping people, um, and you're being helped by people, and that was, I think, what kind of like chipped away the hard sh- rocky shell around my heart and, and maybe find that empathy in people. And I really can't not see it anymore because people were there for me and people that I didn't expect, people that I didn't even know held fundraisers for my family and, and you know, stepped up to help us. And it was kind of embarrassing because I had to you know, publicly, you know, be a part of this thing. And it, you know, it's a personal thing that you're going through. But I think those like really hard experiences, if you if you make something out of it, if you like really set an intention to not have it just be a bad thing that happened to you, one of the benefits is that on the other side of it, you have this empathy for somebody going through a hard time. And that's what I did with the guy in the parking lot. That's what I try to do with all of my students, with anybody that I interact with is how would, how would I benefit from being treated at my lowest point? Hmm. And, it, it, it takes, it's a decision you have to make and it takes effort and it takes a little bit of, I don't know, having to look at, look at things in another light, maybe trying to be forcefully positive. But I feel like the, we were talking about this earlier too, the benefits are, are far greater, right? Once you start doing things with other people in mind, the benefits to yourself and, and to your life are just exponential and you start seeing things sort of open up and not necessarily just opportunities, but just your heart opens up, your mind opens up and, and you start to let go of like that narrow view of like, why is this person like that? And why did this person have to say that? And why does this suck? And why, you know, it like that anti mentality starts turning into a more like, again, going back to improv, a yes. And a positive choosing to know like, Oh, you know, this tragedy is happening. Of course it is. How can we continue to be, a human through it? How can I not lose myself through it? So I think that just going back to teaching and that empathy, it's important to extract that, I think, extract that empathy from shitty experiences that we have so that we can be there for other people when they need it. Yeah, I mean, that's a really yeah. great way to look at life in general. And, you know, you know your situation um, with your parents is you know, it's tragic. And, um, you know, I feel for you for that, but, um, I, I have a ton of respect for you for how you've, you've used it, you know, and, um, taken something that no one would blame you for being upset and angry and bitter about and using that to like actually go the opposite direction and see, yeah, well, like, I have- seeing the good and things, the, the silver linings, maybe you can call it, but like that growth it gave you and that compassion for other people because um yeah like you know that guy in the parking lot could have been going through some of the darkest times in his life and at school it i i learned this 
over and over again, like every year. There's, you know, you always get a kid that gives you a run for the money. Maybe he's trouble or whatever. Doesn't do his work or maybe just some kid you just run into the hallway one day and curses you out, you know? Um, usually I find out that something pretty serious is going on. You know, there's more to the story. It wasn't just he's an evil person. <laughs> it was, there. there's something to it. So it, it has helped me, um, one, not take those things personally, but two, like try to give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe there's, if it's not personal against me, then there's something else more so. And um, I think that's just um, really awesome that you were able to see that, you know, in a dark time and, and take that. I'm sure that would, would make both your parents proud. You know? Thanks, Brian. I, I'm, that's really nice of you to say. I, it did also, you know, it, it puts things into perspective, right? Like honoring their legacy. They're really nice people. And then even you yeah, guys shit was falling up a, a, a part around them. And, and, you know, they were going through this tragedy. They were just super nice, super open hearted, you know, beautiful, beautiful people. And it, made me realize after everything was said and done that the real art is not music. It's not your output. It's how you live your life. At least for me. And, and it's just like, it was this big awakening in me that how you do one thing is how you do everything. Right. Going, I think that was your last episode and, and it's also an improv tenant. And it's something that I tend to follow because it, not, it wasn't easy to be a happy person after a really tragic incident. Right. Like you said, it, it it's easy to, easy to become a little bitter or angry, but um, choosing to not because I, I just, I didn't want to go there. And, and that, that muscle of like making that conscious choice helped me during COVID too. I, I um, it was kind of weird too, because the 13th, when that all started uh, was my grandmother's funeral. I just, I'd lost my dog a week before hmm. then I lost my grandmother and then COVID happened. And I remember sitting in this room and everybody was saying, you know, the world's going to end and music as we know it is going to end. And all I could think of was, well, I've been working on Zoom for like a year and a half now. Why don't we just all hang out on Zoom and do this or try that? And it turned into these amazing opportunities. First and foremost was getting in touch with more Ableton people, right? And like having hangouts with Laura uh, Escudé would do these masterminds at first. And then I started having hangouts with CTs in Mexico and Latin America. And then it just started exploding into workshops and, and gigs. And as a result of me, just like not accepting that like COVID is the sky is falling. So let's just all give up. Um, I felt like I had this advantage of helping people and being parts of community of uh, helping, helping to build a community that um, when other people started saying, well, now we need to stream, like, how do you do an online wedding or how do you do a convention? I was one of the people already doing it. So it opened up an oppor a real life opportunity, like that mindset of being open and, and, and not accepting a dire situation as the end all be all was a really valuable lesson that I learned from that experience with my parents. And um, going back to the art is life thing, that's what prompted me to finally even though like, what you said so perfectly that there's no value maybe in, in music or art that, you know, going and working at a bank or, you know, being a, a, a real estate agent, you could definitely make some concrete, like not only money, but like improvements to your life that maybe you couldn't necessarily with art. So that whole, the real art is life perspective shift in my mindset was what I needed to see to say like, okay, well, how can I marry the two? How can I, still be an ambitious person that wants to be entrepreneurial, but never let go of my creative side and my desire to work with music and sound. And, you know, fast forward, um, I guess it's been six years now and I'm making a living doing what I love. I never really feel like I'm working, even though sometimes it's like 17, 18 hour days and I get to talk to um, some people like you. So <laughs> it worked. Yeah. I like that. The real art is life, how you live your life. I think it connects. I mean, I, I often find that these conversations are, we might be talking about music, but you can almost just substitute out anything. And, and it seems to apply. At least the, the real hard truths of it seem like they kind of connect in a lot of different ways. So 
um yeah i went through like a point last it was about a year ago i guess you know like because like especially like a year ago like after um everything locked down and um you know i kind of had this realization and i thought maybe like the world would that we're all really like interconnected and dependent on each other and the health of a person in one part of the world does matter to another person so you know we can think like it's all the way over there it's not my problem but um we're we're on the same planet with you know we're connected it's it's it it seemed like an obvious um you know reminder of that but um also what we saw a lot was a lot more division happening and and that might be because we were all home alone not seeing each other and we were in our own little bubble on the internet getting our opinion reinforced because that's what we vote on by clicking on things like if you look at my feeds it looks like everyone in the world is into like modular synthesis and you know like everyone's making beats and it's such a small fraction and i think whatever it is you're into that's what you're seeing and it just caused like a lot of division you know and um i i felt just like this is pointless what am i doing this for like this is silly and but it was funny it was in a way like it was the very thing too that pulled me out of it because yeah. it was the thing that helped me is what i can do when i'm feeling down and where i can find some meaning and and all those uh lessons you learned from it like helped dig me out of the hole a little and it's done it a million times in my life before even when it itself is the problem <laughs> you know so yeah. Yeah. So I'm really grateful to be part of this, the, the Ableton certified trainer community. I'll say this to you again, like the, the work that you're doing, if you're ever in doubt, just give me a call because I, I'll <laughs> say it a million times. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if you hadn't been doing what you're doing. And that inspired me to do what I do because I thought, well, who am I going to inspire now? And um, just going back to the in, certified trainer community in general, I think having just gone through that experience with my parents that I described earlier and uh, to take care of them and stuff and having to not focus on myself for like about two years and then going through this really sad period after and being really lost and depressed. Um, finding out that you became a certified trainer. I remember you, you posted about it and going, well, what is that? And then finding out that Laura was also a certified trainer and like, oh, they get to teach and they work with artists and all this. And then pursuing that and finding out that every single human being that I've met through Ableton and through the Certified Trainer Program is an amazing individual, not only in talent, but in their humanity, in their personality, in their openness. I wish I could like name every single one of them hmm. by memory and, and, and thank them out loud uh, on your podcast because I really do feel this like genuine appreciation. For example, when, when COVID hit and Laura was doing her masterminds, Roy Bettis from Germany, I don't know if you've met him, he's a really talented guy. He brought up this point like, hey guys, no matter what's going on in any one of our countries, we still get to do what we love. Like the world is, you know, back when we thought the world was ending and we're still talking about music and we're still teaching people to make music. And that really washed over me that first month. I think it was still April when he said that. And that was my, like, my armor for the rest of the year going like, yeah, it's true. How lucky am I that I took this leap of like, after following my inspirations to call you that and, and, and following my inspirations and ended up landing on my feet and being able to start my own business where I get to only do what I want. And even when so many businesses are shuttering and so many people are, are, are suffering to be fortunate to still do what I love and, and maybe even see a little bit of a boost. Cause I think a lot of, us that taught creative fields online or, or did freelancing or consulting saw a definite boost and it was sort of a, a weird feeling to say oh the world's ending and people are suffering but i'm doing all right and it was a good affirmation but it was definitely not something you'd want to celebrate right because you know there's a lot of suffering going on but it still needed to be said that in in like when the worst of the worst we still got to do something so outlandish like so <laughs> pointless to so many people but really it's not pointless it has so much to offer and that's why 
even in a, in a pandemic, people were looking to express themselves. Yeah, I mean, just like us, people turn to that. They turn to the art, the music, whatever it is. They they had the time and definitely needed the distraction or the outlet. You know, that's look. I mean, you you like take a pressure cooker and you don't let it have an outlet. The thing explodes, and like that's us too. You 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 gotta have those. And um, the happiest people I know have usually multiple different outlets, like ways they can get stuff out. And, and the people that are struggling, they don't, you know, and they're, they don't know what to do with themselves in those situations. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it, it gives you a lot to be thankful for and grateful for. And, and that's a, a really like good feeling to have. Um, I I heard somewhere like you can't be grateful and angry at the same time. Like, mm. like apparently it's impossible. And I think it makes a lot of sense to me because how can you be like really pissed about something and be like, yeah, well, at least I have my health and <laughs> yeah, uh, or whatever it is. Like, uh, oh, I'm mad, but I have people that love me. <laughs> and <laughs> it kind of like fades it out for you. Um, and it's it's contagious and it, it it comes back to you and uh you know i really appreciate all those nice things you said to me and and i find what you're doing inspiring you know it and i'm, I'm grateful to have had the chance to help you and i'm grateful now to have you on the show talking sharing with me what, what you're learning and what you're doing which i think is super impressive and exciting and um it you know like the positive creates more positive Definitely. Contagious. Energy is contagious, whether it's good or bad, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Cool, man. Maybe we should leave it at that, you know? Let the people uh, soak that up, you know? We'll all, <laughs> I think that's a nice note for us all to go on. Um, so we can send people to musicalguest.net to check out you, your work, get in contact with you. Um, don't be shy about reaching out to Alberto. He's not shy about reaching out to others, as he said. So I would love it if people reached out. I, I love meeting people and you know finding out how we can help each other out. Yeah. Also, uh, musical guest, all one word on Instagram. That's usually where I post a lot of the stuff. The website's more of a, you know, what websites have been turning into now, where it's just like, hey, this is what I do, mm -hmm. and maybe visit it, but who knows. Well, I think they're good to have because if Instagram decides to do something funny that affects how you reach people, I mean, yeah. I saw that on Facebook. I thought that was a good place to put my energy or, or even MySpace. Oh. Uh, my la one of my last bands, we were all into MySpace and then everyone left. <laughs> on times though, that, you know, early MySpace explosion of like people sharing your music and yeah, it was cool. It granted now but i remember it was just such a fun time yeah it was awesome you just went to the page and it played and it, it was yeah it was fun but then all of a sudden no one was there anymore but at least like your website email lists i think it's good to have control over that because um we don't want the illusion that you have control over your instagram and your followers or um that's you, you know you're using that for free so that that's all theirs. They own that. At least, um, you know, for anyone, this you should have your own something yours that no one can take away from you. Yeah. So, but yeah, the Instagram is cool. I like it too. <laughs> nice. Well, um, anything coming up? Anything you want to let people know about? Check you out here. You're going to be there doing any presentations or anything? I've got. Um... And I'll just tease this. I'll tell you off mic, maybe a, a, a little bit. I just have this thing that I've been working towards for a while that I'll be announcing maybe in a month, hopefully. Um, just a, a, a cool project that finally um, I was able to make happen. Uh, just because of the nature of the people I'll be working with, I really can't talk about it publicly. But if you follow my Instagram, I will definitely be making an announcement. All right. That's exciting. Very good. Well, thanks so much, man. It's been awesome talking to you. We'll have to do it again soon, and you do not need an excuse to come on here. I mean, as you can tell, we, we have plenty to talk about. 
So Thanks, I, I feel Thanks. uplifted talking to you. So that's reason enough for me. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And uh, I'll, I'll definitely hold you up to that in second invitation. Nice. Cool, man. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Go to musicalguest.net and enjoy your day.